Alicia and Glenna, thank y'all for doing that. That was amazing. It really was. Um, before I talk about anything else, I want to open up in prayer. So, Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity we have to be in your house, to fellowship together, and to learn more about you, Lord. Just please be with Marty and his family during this time, Lord. We pray that your will is done in this situation. We pray that you bring their family and them the peace and comfort that only you can, Lord. And I also pray that you just be with me now as I uh, deliver a message, just, you know, by your will, Lord, hopefully it will be still effective for somebody in here to hear what they need to hear, Lord, and we know it will be. We just serve you, and, and we know that you have control of everything, Father, and we love you so much, and we ask this through your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I found out the hard way this morning that I should always have something prepared. I don't have anything prepared, so we might be done in 10 minutes. So we'll see how it goes. Since I don't have anything prepared, I figured it'd be a good time to, I don't know, it'd be a good opportunity for me to tell y'all about me a little bit and kind of some of my background. And I guess maybe like a mini testimony, but I haven't put it together. I don't know how it's going to go, but it's something that I want to do because this church <coughs> and, and all of you are very special to me. Um, I was raised in church. I was raised in a Methodist church. I attended regularly. But I can say just in the short time that I've been here at Loco with you and that these few short years, I've experienced more growth than I have in my whole life. So it is... With that being said, though, I feel like it's fair, especially since I've already been up here twice. This is my third time that I'm, I'm going to deliver a message. It's only fair that you know a little bit about me, though. All right. So I guess where I want to start is, is that I was I was raised in church. I was raised in the Methodist church. Um, I knew you know, a lot of stuff. I didn't know as much as I know now, but I knew all the basics, I guess you could say. Um, then when I went off to college, though, that's kind of where I want my story to pick up. We talked this morning in Sunday school about how important it is for people to, or how important it is for Christians to go to church, right? Because we, there was six of us in Sunday school, and between people that are in school, people that have jobs, we all agree that not a single one of us is in an environment where we're surrounded by mostly Christians all the time. Right? I know I'm not. Most of the people I work with at school aren't Christians. I'm sure but probably most of the people you work with, would you consider them to be Christians? Okay, no, I, I would say very rarely we would be in a situation where we are surrounded by mostly other Christians all the time, which is why it's so important to come to church, to be actively involved in church, because the Bible talks about, and I hope I don't misquote this terribly, I don't know what the verse is, but it talks about it compares us as spiritual babies. It compares the word to milk, and it talks about how important it is for us as, as for our spirit to have the word, to grow, to be nourished. All right, We need that constantly. Because what you're about to hear is, even though I was raised in the church, as soon as I got taken out of my environment where I'd been grown up, or all the time I'd been raised, things changed really quickly. So I went off to school, um, I went to Georgia College in Millersville, and I'm not proud to say, but as I went off to school, I stopped going to church. All right? I went every Sunday growing up, but when I got off to school and I was on my own, I didn't go anymore. And all my friends that I was with, they didn't go to church. Okay, well, so we start, you know, I, I lasted for about a year. My first year, my freshman year, I did pretty good. I was responsible. I did everything I was supposed to do. You know, I really, you know, I didn't get into the drinking and stuff like that. But by kind of the beginning of my sophomore year, I broke up with my girlfriend at the time. She was, uh, you know, we were dating my senior year of high school. We went to school together. So I still, you still kind of have that 
like connection, like that. I don't know the word I'm looking for, but like the sameness, all right? Like you still were, things were still kind of similar to how they used to be, all right? But when I broke up with her, then I was kind of, I felt, all right, I'm really like on my own now. Like there's, I'm completely removed from all the stuff that I kind of brought with me to, to school from home. And so, you know, once I hit that point, it didn't take long at all. Um, I did. I, one thing y'all might not know about me is I did. I started to drink a lot. Um, and it didn't take long to where I got to the point to where that was the most, like, that was my thing. That's what I did, you know. As awful as it is to say, I got to be honest with you, I fully consider myself probably to have been an alcoholic because for four years of my life, actually five years, my sophomore, junior, senior year, then I stayed for one year graduate school, so that's four years, and then I took my first job down in Albany, Georgia, where I was uh, working at a school down there. That was five years, and I'm being honest with you, all I did was drink heavy and hard all the time. And when I, when it was like when you're in school, it, it wasn't, it was almost like part of the culture. You know, and I'm not making excuses, but I'm just telling you how it is. When that's what everybody else is doing, it's a lot easier just to kind of slide in there and do it with them. So, you know, when I was in school, I was like, okay, no big deal. Like, I'll stop Sunday, whatever. Like, everyone's doing it now. I'm going to do it too. So then I take my job in Albany, and it's different because now I'm living by myself. I don't have all my friends. I don't have my family down there. I'm four hours away from everybody. So again, even though now I've got a full-time job, I'm still drinking. I come home in the afternoon and I would just drink because that's what I've been doing the last four years. I kept doing it. Um, but it got to a point to where that year, you know, having a job, it was a hard year for me because again, you go from being removed from the college environment, okay, you go to class for maybe two or three hours a day and you got the rest of free time, you can do whatever you want. Well. Now I'm in an environment where I'm teaching, I'm only 23 years old at the time, and that school, it was a, you know, more of a low socioeconomic, um, you know, it was, the culture of that place wasn't one where education was really valued as much. Um, so, you know, some of the seniors I was teaching that year were 20 years old. They're 20, I'm 23, there's only three years different. They don't look at me as being a teacher. They look at me as a young guy who's their friend and pushover type deal, and it happens. I'm sure Diane, you could probably relate. I don't know, you probably see kids like that, you know. Yeah. So anyway, that was a it was a hard year for me. And so about halfway through the year, you know, I'm kind of depressed. I'm like, you know, this sucks. I don't like my job. I don't like being down here. So I started praying again. So now, it was about a 35-minute drive to work every day. Instead of listening to the radio, I, it was quiet time. I would pray on the way to work. I was like, I'm tired of this. Like, this is awful. So I start praying. And as I kind of slowly start building my relationship back with God a little bit. And then, I'm on the way there. Because you know, old habits die hard. I'm coming off of four years of drinking all the time. So I'm praying in the morning on the way to school. When I get done with work in the afternoon, I'm still stopping at the liquor store on the way home, taking it back to my apartment. Because I'm so now I find myself in a, I don't know, an interesting situation. And this is where I really started to change to kind of like where God was like, all right, you got to make a decision now. I could say I was literally at crossroads in my life. Because what was happening was I was, you know, praying, heartfelt. You know, I felt like the Holy Spirit was giving me what I needed. That work started getting better. I was able to get through it. But I'm still doing the stuff I'm not supposed to be doing. That's contradicting. You know, I'm like a contradiction to myself, basically. So after a while, after this, you know, I was still drinking. But what changed was that I was starting to get this feeling. And I can't explain it. It's, it's a feeling I can't put words to. It's not a, it wasn't a hangover, because I knew what that was. I've been, you know, drinking for so long. The best way I can, and can explain it is like, a, it was a despair. I, I was waking up in the middle of the night with just the worst, sinking, despair, awful feeling. Now, at the time, I couldn't explain it. 
now I attribute that to that was you know that's the Holy Spirit in me being like what you're doing is wrong like because you're you're coming to me I'm helping you you're doing this you're you're making the effort to reach out to me but you've actually got to start you know following you've got to make me the priority you can't keep doing what you've been doing if you're going to follow me now and that's I, I I don't have a word for it. I don't, you know, it could be in scripture somewhere. I'm sure it probably is, but I don't know what it is. Now, me being hard-headed, I was still doing this. This happened probably like 20 or 25 more times. Like, I would wake up with just the worst feeling. Can't explain it. Awful. The only thing that would make it better was when I would start praying again. So anyway, I finally get to this point where he's like, hit me on the head over and over again enough to be like, you know, you don't need to be doing this to where I finally started changing my whole thought process. Okay, well, I still wanted to drink, but now I'd be like, you know what? If I drink, I'm going to feel awful after I do it. So maybe I just shouldn't do it in the first place. And now, again, this is a gradual process. It isn't just overnight, okay? I started praying and everything got better. Okay, that's not how it worked. But... You know, over time, like I said, this happened numerous times. I finally got around to the point to where I was like, you know, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I either had to fully give myself over to God and, and his Holy Spirit, or I had to stop praying probably if I didn't continue drinking. I got to a crossroads. Like, what, what am I going to do with it? Um, you know, and, and eventually, like I said, I got to the point to where I decided, you know, I, this life isn't for me. You start, you know, I, it's like, like I said, when I come here, this church was a big deal to me. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful that I met Kimber at school and that I know Marsha and Harry and their family now because completely coming here, getting involved in the church is really what makes a big difference in starting to separate yourself from that other lifestyle right you have you, you start going to church you start getting involved you I mean, it's, it's basically just being obedient to god all right you start doing that and that's where your change is going to come about now i know that i haven't you know it's not been very clear what i'm trying to say and not being um, you know good with the words right now but that for me personally was like my turning point is when I got to that that situation, and that's how. And I, when I look back on it, I don't look back at it as being like I, I recognize it as being not a good time in my life, but I don't regret that it ever happened because that to me that's what God used to turn me around and get me to where I where I am now. You know, if I had never gone through that trial at that time in my life, then who knows? You know, I might not be where I am now. I might still be. We talked about in Sunday school this morning. I still might be one of those lukewarm Christians. It's kind of like, yeah, I know all this stuff, but it's not a priority in my life, you know. Um, so I don't regret that. And the word, the the verse that I want to use today is John sixteen thirty three, and I chose this one because it's my favorite verse. Like honestly, in the whole Bible, this is my favorite verse. Because no matter what you're going through, it speaks to everything. So in John 16, 33, and I can remember I had this. I can, and, you know, again, I'm not proud of this, but I can remember a time when I was at school, when I first showed up, I had Bible verses like pinned up in my room on my bulletin board. I can remember a specific time where I was like, you know what? Like, forget this. And I can remember taking them down and throwing them in the trash can. <laughs> So, but anyway, this has always been my favorite, and I'm sure it always will be my favorite. But in John chapter 16, verse 33, this is Jesus talking, and he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. But listen now, this is where it gets good. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And you know, that's one of those verses really where you can just be like, that's enough said. And that says it all. Um, you know, Jesus overcame everything. He overcame alcoholism, if that's what you're struggling with. He's overcome your sickness, if that's struggling with. 
He, what we have to understand is he's bigger than all of that. And you know, you're probably going to come to a point where you have to make the decision, okay, am I, am I going to be the one to keep trying to deal with this on my own or to, you know, I don't need him, I can handle it. Or are you going to come to the realization that it's, it's too big for you? You need Jesus to do it for you. And another important thing we need to understand is, and I know Marty has talked about it before, but don't, don't expect, you know, God to take this from you. You've got to be man enough and strong enough in your faith to say, I'm giving this to you. You've got to come to that point where you say, you know what? I know I can't do it. I'm not strong enough. So I'm going to give this to you because you are big enough and strong enough and you can handle this. And that's very important. It's, it's, it's a very important step in your faith as you grow. So I guess when we were in, you know, I, I want to keep going back to what we talked about in Sunday school this morning, but when there, there's important responsibilities that we're supposed to have, all right, you take the first step, you finally give your life over to God. It doesn't mean everything gets perfect. Like I said, I gave my life over to God and I was still dealing with the drinking problem. Well, again, you've got to make your choice of what you're going to follow. In Romans chapter 1, you don't have to turn to it if you want. I'm just going to go through it quick. But what we talked about in Sunday school today was in Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 15, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, he's talking about specific qualities that are important for people to have. All right, the first one is prayer. So that's prayer in all situations, but especially for others. The second one is you've got to serve God with your whole heart. The third one is, and Kim, this is Kimber's word, she said the quality, but what she means by that is don't just select who you're going to share the message of Jesus with. Okay, all in Paul's words, he said, Greek, non-Greek, wise, or foolish. Well, to us, you know, that might not apply as much, but, you know, don't be like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna talk to Jackson about Jesus, you know, but I'm, I'm not going to talk to Mary, or I'm not going to talk to Gracie about Jesus. No, you've got to tell everybody. Then the other one is, you've got to work together with others. So I kind of started with this, and I guess I'm going to finish with this, but I cannot... Under, or I can't overstate how important it is that as a as a believer, you've got to be involved like with other believers, and you've got to be involved in the church. Like it did not take me long at all when I stopped going to church to completely just fall away from it. All right now, my faith wasn't where it should have been at the time, but still, you know, if I was still going to church, if I surrounded myself with the right type of people, that would have made a big difference. Um, it, you know, I can't. I'm sorry that I couldn't have put a better or made this message better or more clear to you, but like I said, this was something that I did. I wanted to share with y'all because I care about y'all and I love this church. And you know, like I said, it's important. I don't want it, I don't want anyone to feel like they don't know who I am or that I have any secrets. Right? So that's was my biggest one. That was my biggest secret. Now you know it. I used to have a drinking problem, I drank all the time. And the only reason I got over it was because God and Jesus and my faith and my obedience and taking those steps to follow him, that is what's brought me to where I am now. And I'm excited for the rest of my life, however long that may be, to keep on that path, to keep doing that. You know, three or four months ago, I would have told you there's no way I would ever get up here and try to talk to people, especially without having a chance to plan something. But, you know, the more you know God and the more you grow in God, you understand it's not about you. It's about Him. And He'll use you however He wants to use you if you let Him do it. One of my favorite messages, I heard uh, a Tony Evans sermon one time. He talked about, you're only going to get from God as much as you give to God. And the example he used was, okay, say you go to the beach, you go to the ocean, and you take a little cup, and you scoop up the water. Well, you're only going to get a little cup of water. If you go with the bucket, you scoop the ocean, you're going to get a bucket's worth of that water. And it keeps going bigger and bigger. But the point being, whatever you 
take or whatever you present is only amount, you know, the amount that you're going to get back from God in return. So, and that was, you know, that just made sense to me as far as really bringing home the point. Why, why would we want to go to the God with like a cup when we could go to God with, I don't know, a bathtub, something bigger than us, something where we can just, you know, the more you open yourself up, the more you're going to get in return. And that just comes with faith, with growing, in, you know, growing in obedience and, and doing what you're supposed to be doing. So <coughs> that's about all I have. Um, you know, I, it was just important for me to give this message to you just so that you could kind of know who I was. Now, I don't feel like there's any secret. Not that I was trying to hide it in the first place, but I'm glad y'all know now. So anyway, I guess let's close in prayer. Thank you.